Good morning all. To start off with, I want to see if you can see the anomaly in the data that we're looking at right now just from the file size from the Vaccine Adverse Reporting System. All right, it is now May 16th, 12.48 a.m. And once again, good morning to you all. Here we are looking at the virus system. Now, here's the data. That, for example, well, let's, let's, let's to highlight the whole thing. There's your file sizes. All right. Now let's look at 2020. Let's look at this particular file size right here. 40.34 megabytes. It's 2021. 127.77 megabytes. Now keep in mind, 20. This is for the entire year of 2020. And of course, the VARES data is as follows. VARES data is reporting adverse events. So you have whole of 2020, all the adverse events, events reported totaled 40 megabytes. It is now May 16th, 2021. Now keep in mind, I only processed that up to May 7th. And the file size 127 megabytes. Now, keep in mind, before I go to the next page, we are going to look at the data first and then go into some of the research that we have up here. We want to look at the data first, and this is not designed to inspire fear, uh, to scare people away from certain medical treatments. It is geared more towards individuals which are uh, either epidemiologists, biostatisticians, data analytics, that can basically not get too emotionally uh, engaged into the information, which can bias further information that we review. Meaning, as we review the first the information, don't get emotionally attached to it or try not to. I have a difficult time myself. So let's get into the data as follows. Yeah. So we're looking about basically over three times the file size. That's what drew my attention. So now we go deeper into the file. I'll show you how I process the file in a little bit, uh, but basically uh, again, that's going to be more for the data analyst that uh, basically works with um, scraping data. But let us begin. Let's take case number 182556. The reporter informed there were two deaths of those who received their second dose of Moderna vaccine, same day, same location, who died two hours, two hours after the vaccine administration. Now, this is the tail end of the data. So that would be case number 182556, meaning... 182,556 reactions up to May 7th. Reactions so strong that they basically ended up being part of the VARA system. And so look at this. Now, basically, again, for those not familiar with data analytics or the VARA system, there could be confounding biases, other factors that could be involved. But normally, if you had two deaths in the same location, uh, within a few hours of each other uh, after vaccine administration, you would think that would make a little bit of interest in reference to the news. But again, we're all familiar with our channels right now, and there's a tremendous amount of bias and rah, 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 which unfortunately can basically create uh, problems in eliciting truthful information, or I should say accurate information, so people can make a good judgment call. Uh, but as we proceed as follows, what we're looking at here is the symptom text in the VARES system. Let's look, review, well, let's review a little bit more of the text so you get an idea. All right, this is the tail. And let's look at one more thing from the tail. Let's go to 182. Uh, basically, you'll learn how to read this as we proceed forward anyways. Uh, 182. 118, let's use this one. All right, now keep in mind, I moved everything to lowercase, so it's not that they have problems with grammar. I moved everything to lowercase because what I'm gonna end up doing next week is look for clots, hemorrhaging, strokes, so on and so forth, so I can see if I can develop a database in which to basically elicit uh, most likely the cause of reactions. Now, here we go. Now, these right here we're looking at right now, uh, I should take that back. These are just the deaths. It doesn't mean there's 182. Seven. That means reaction number 182,118 was recorded as a death. 
Same day when patient received the second vaccine, she was overcome with generalized fatigue, nausea. By the fourth, her legs would not hold her when she tried to stand getting out of bed. She was nauseous to the point of not being able to eat or drink. In fact, she did not have the strength or desire to eat or drink. By the fifth day post-vaccine, quote, I took her to the emergency room because she was so fatigued. She just slept and she couldn't stay awake to eat or drink. She was able to get up to the car with the walker, but that was the last time she walked. Again, I have a difficult time not becoming emotionally engaged in after reading this, but however, though, it's something that has to be done because no one else is doing it. After, after time out of hospital and she was skilled in skilled nursing, she passed away on March 21st, 2021. She never regained the ability to toilet herself, eat on her own, failed to eat a drink, and eventually was put on hospice because she lost 30 pounds over the month uh, uh, from failure to eat or drink. Even though I was there or the nurse was there to feed her every meal and try to get her to take fluids, her fatigue was just overwhelming. When she first arrived at the emergency room, presented within two days of weakness in arms, fever, and whatever the am is, fever, nausea, and generalized fatigue, a word, finding difficulty without stroke or acute abnormal, da, 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 according to the hospital. All right, this is a difficult thing for me to do as you're going through this because it can form a very, very strong uh, bias, uh, you know, against certain medical inoculations. Uh, let us proceed first, this is the tail. Let's go to the head. This is for data analytics, and this is how we, we pulled it up there. Uh, let's just try 4301, right there. Vaccine given on December 29th, 2020, by pharmacy. Resident became lethargic and sluggish and developed a rash on forearms. He was a hospice resident, and a doctor in hospice ordered no treatment, just to continue to monitor. When no improvement of condition reported, doctor and hospice ordered comfort meds. Resident expired on January 4th, 2021. All right, let's go to 3804. Uh, PCR done, symptoms January 1st, 2021. COVID test came back positive, deceased January 4th. It just goes on and on. Now keep in mind, this is not all COVID-19 vaccines. And we're all doing is we're reading the people that died. And so again, it's difficult for anybody that has, you know, any sort of attachment, or as you read the stories, it makes it very personal. And uh, so as you go through here, you could you could see everything else. And again, I have it all lowercase because I want to be able to uh, query certain words to see if certain conditions or patterns are baked into form. All right, now let's look at this. How do our reactions differ basically from 2020? Number of reactions reported, 2020. This is the whole 2020, as you see right there. 2021, right there. This is the number of reactions reported. And again, these are serious. Most of these are uh, not necessarily all serious, serious, uh, but these not serious enough to uh, basically report to VARES. And again, a lot of it has to be worked out to see if, what, if they're actually related or someone just could have had bad food. Not deaths that we've read, but you know, per se. Again, and what we're looking at here, for those looking for the download the data frames on their own, the trick is to get into the VARA system is you have to encode it in Latin one for those data analytics, you know, or you know, with working with Python like I do, they'll understand exactly what I mean. We merged the files, merged the files. I only merged two of the files so far because I wasn't really uh, planning to, I, didn't have, I was short on time, to be honest with you, to determine which vaccines, which batches were responsible for which reactions, why the files are not merged already on their own, Again, I think that, that could be mainly to antiquated data collection. All right, so let's look at our serious reactions that require hospitalization or worse. Uh, as we basically look at died, disabled, birth defect, or hospital. I, it's unusual certain birth defects are already there considering the vaccine just came out not too long ago. Not a large amount, and many, many that be solely related to the COVID vaccines, but still I'll find out next week for you. Um, and here we are, there's our value counts. So you can see right there, those are one of uh, basically weed through that the coding, you can see it. Uh, we're basically working with Boolean coding. And now we go to serious vaccine events. All right, now remember, we're only dealing up to May 7th. Deaths, 4,015 recorded in the database. Not necessarily all due to COVID-19 vaccines, but keep that in mind. 
Disable 2,553. Birth defects 111, which again, uh, it'd be too early that, to get a good bearing on the COVID vaccines. Even then, that'd be a very small amount compared to large number of vaccines. But however, though, you know, to the person that's affected, that means a lot. Um, hospitalized, 11,557. And again, that is just as May 2020. So, you know, it's five months in and, uh, and it's only the first part of May that this database works with. So you, you get where I'm going with that. All right. So basically, again, just to leave it up here for real fast. So if you want to look at the objects that were there, the what's there, again, a lot of people aren't going to like this video because it's data analytics. But however, though, um, a few of you out there may appreciate it. But let's get right into basically information as follows. Again, I don't do that. I'm a demonetized channel with very few views, uh, but the people that do watch, I am always grateful for and their intent in learning more. And again, I'm not political one way or the other, and I'm not anti-vaccine one way or the other. But you know what? When you have this going on and it's not being reported by any media channels or newspapers, you know, I'm in the dark corners of YouTube, but however, though, still, maybe after we report this, someone will run with it and become, um, do the right thing. All right, to proceed as follows. Let's get into the data. All right, first one, nothing really good this week as far as basically what helps prevent um, uh, or helps uh, mitigate COVID. I think we, most of the researchers have basically done everything. Uh, from certain nutrients uh, to certain medications to UV light to heat to ozone. Uh, they've thrown everything out there. And it was just really up to just basically to the bureaucratic uh, you know, wheels to incorporate it. But how many of you seen UV treatment? How many of you seen heat treatment in reference to uh, environments? Uh, how many of you seen ozonation? Uh, there's so many things which are available to work, uh, but there's been no incorpororation it's just again I would say it's just we're using the same technology from the Justinian plague uh, but however though let us get into this as follows this is important because this leaves the door open for further infection so here we are uh, what are we looking at we are looking at hand dermatitis and two-thirds of public due to stringent hand hygiene during the COVID however though if you are a healthcare professional what is your statistic here we go Right there. It says basically a study of a certain number of individuals. Results indicated. Let's start from here. Da, da, da. Let's start right here. All right, it's not it's doing it. Dang it. Well, here it goes. Results indicated that hand dermatitis was now present among 92.6% of healthcare providers and 68.7% of the general population. Now, for those which are, are immunologists uh, geared, we all recognize how incredibly important the microbiome of the skin is in the prevention of picking up other ailments and diseases. In fact, let's let's keep on reading. Uh, da, 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 the higher mean, uh, TEWL, drier skin, was noted in females and intensive care professionals. It was associated with higher frequency of hand washing and alcohol-based hand rubs. Both healthcare providers, participants for the general public, the studies that skin irritation and dryness was the main barrier to consistent practice of hand hygiene. They have hand dermatitis, and they basically uh, they ended this way. And TEWL, for those not familiar, is uh, transepidermal water loss, so extremely dry skin. But this is what they call it, and she she labels it right. You know, people are going to build to being eczema and dermatitis in the future. But she said, quote, uh, this research shows there is now a skin disease epidemic within the COVID-19 pandemic. It is promising to see this problem being recognized. And I'm excited to see how the dermatology community goes about finding potential solutions to this issue. Well, it's May 6, 2021, and that came out. Yeah, let's jump on that. Because if that microbiome, and we've talked about dysbiosis and things along those lines, is disrupted in 92.6% of healthcare providers are now experiencing hand dermatitis, 
and then they got to put latex gloves on potentially and things along those lines. That's staggering. But to proceed as follows, the next one as this is this one's a little bit more interesting. Again, we don't have a lot of the, the good stuff this week, but however, though, I don't want to be negative, but this is really interesting as far as the data. Listen to this. Ohio State University researchers said to determine whether saliva is the main source of spread because only 1% of dentists ever test positive for COVID. Now, you think about that, only 1% as opposed to the general population and their exposure, that's an epidemiologist's goldmine to figure out why. So they're looking at it now. Finally, it's May 13th. Ohio State University, now really, here, here comes the mystery. It's going to come up real soon. Ohio State University research set out to determine whether saliva is the main source of the spray, collecting samples from personnel, equipment, and other surfaces reached by aerosols in a range of dental procedures. By analyzing the genetic makeup of the organisms detected in those samples, the research determined that water solution from irrigation tools, not saliva, was the main source of any bacteria or viruses present in the spatter and spurts from patients' mouth. All right, you're going, what? Not saliva? What, what the heck was about the mask? But let's proceed. Even when low levels of SARS-CoV-2 virus were detected in the saliva of asymptomatic patients, the aerosols generated during their procedure showed no sign of the coronavirus. In essence, from the microbial, microbial standpoint, the contents of the spray mirrored what was in the office environment. And then I conclude like this way. Getting your teeth clean does not increase your risk of COVID-19 infection any more than drinking a glass of water from the dentist's office does. Now, again, studies need to be repeated and replicated in order to basically verify the findings. But they're not using the Petri dishes anymore. They're using genetic testing. And that's way beyond the Petri dish thing uh, that we did when this, we first basically entered this pandemic. So basically... It is really, really confounding when you hear about that. Now, there's some hypothesis in reference to maybe uh, more fluid in the mouth, the irrigation, you know, dilution. Uh, one of the people which I, you know, deal with said possibly it could be fluoride. It could be antiseptic in the mouth. It could be something else that's doing. But whatever the case is, that is an epidemiologist gold mine. Here you have individuals that are creating aerosols that are showing no signs of coronavirus. These findings should help us open up practices and make ourselves feel safe about our environment and for patients get their oral dental problems treated. There's so much evidence emerging that if you have poor oral health, you are more susceptible to COVID. All right. So that is a real, again, it's food for thought. It, it, it's something you would expect that if a person's in a dentist's office, that it must be a COVID bonanza. But to have nothing detected in the aerosols of individuals that have uh, SARS-CoV-2, that is really food for thought. Let's put it that way. And again, it shows right here. Uh, let's see if it goes down to the, yeah. Uh, no matter what procedure can condense on the hand land, and microbes from irrigants contributed 78% of the organisms in, in aerosols while saliva if present accounted for 0.1% to 1.2% of the microbes distributed around the room. And it goes right here. Here it is. The findings reassuring would let us make sense. Irrigant dilute saliva, that's a hypothesis, a thick, vicious substance, by an estimate of 20 to 200 fold. And the research is validated by a 2020 study reported less than 1% COVID-19 positivity rate among dentists. So it seems like almost like your greatest uh, protection from basically COVID is to be a dentist. Again, that's extremely, had a tremendous amount of publisher bias. But still, just the same, it is food for thought, especially for immunologists out there that are basically working with uh, trying to determine environmental procedures, so on and so forth, which leads us into the next study. This is the study that a lot of bureaucratic individuals were using to rationalize their outdoor restrictions, recent outdoor restrictions. But the study that they're referencing, at least for a few, does not say anything about preventing people from being outdoors or gathering from people outdoors. And even the researchers themselves, and this is from Oxford University, so I don't, so basically I think Oxford University should almost sue for slander due to the fact that even in the elements that are on CDC did not read the conclusion of the study. 
most likely, or other. Now, my problem is, obviously, for those which are taking advantage of uncertainty, they've almost begun to uh, use uncertainty, again, as a weapon. And, you know, when you have, what we do, we did the, um, you know, antigen testing for asymptomatic individuals had a 72% fall positive rate. Uh, the vaccine effectiveness for the, uh, a lot of the vaccines, for example, uh, well, I'll show you that in a second. It was just, it was just, it was just like anywhere from, you have to vaccinate 212 people to prevent one infection. If you go by the Israeli study, 119, if you go by the phase three trial results, you know, there's, there are certain individuals that are trying to keep uncertainty into the game. And because when you have uncertainty, besides lack of accountability, you can really, really use that to manipulate the situation poorly. But again, I digress. But to proceed as follows, this is what they did. You saw this information. You heard a lot of politicians quote it. And you just heard it recently uh, when they were grilling the CDC director. Uh, five identified studies have a low proportion of global SARS infections occurred outdoors. They didn't have a lot of studies. So they said, you know, less than 10%. And of course, they used the word 10%. They rounded up. And the odds of the indoor transmission was very highly compared to outdoors, blah, blah, blah. All right, and I, you have to give credit. It was, I think, uh, when the papers uh, broke the story. And if it wasn't for them, they would still be quoting the 10% thing. But here we go. So you go down the story, and the conclusion is this. This is what I'm trying to say you can't fault Oxford University because they didn't do anything wrong. They worked with the best information that available at the time. And they came out with this, ready? While it's been acknowledged that spreading time, spending time outside has general health benefits, our view posits that there posits, posits, that there is also benefits in reducing transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by reducing exposure time, substitu substituting time indoors with time outdoors. <laughs> That's what they said. These results suggest that moving activities in outdoor setting may reduce infections and help me save lives. However, it is important to note that the infections are possible outdoors and the advantage may be overtaken by relaxed mitigation. They said there was a lot of limitation, uh, limitations to the data and the data that they used was as follows. You ready for this? Here it goes. Ba -ba -ba. Right there. There was an outbreak in Georgia, which was not purely outdoors. They found one transmission while jogging in Italy. Um, and that was the one that showed us like one in 1,000 chance of catching it outdoors. Four outbreaks in Singapore. I have no clue how they, they oh, oh, because of 95. I see what they did. Um, but they somehow they extrapolated 10%. 20 cases of an outdoor park in Munster, Germany. This is the data they had available as of February 2021. And as you can tell how important clarity of data is in sourcing that data. The fact that uh, the CDC director bit on the 10% and did not scroll down and then used the same article as its reference for its rationale. Well, again, I'm not going to say anything bad about anybody. Um, and again, this is interesting because you read this right here. This is overnight summer camp. Yes, they stated that NPI was not effective. NPI is recorded in NPI BM non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, physical distancing, outside cabin, enhanced cleaning, disinfection, uh, especially shared equipment spaces, cloth masks required for staff, mem staff members. Evidently, these interventions were not affected at pre <laughs> preventing a majority of the cases. It is amazing how we cherry pick our research. Again, we don't have a lot of information to go over tonight, so I'm going to review a little information that basically is affecting our lives. That's policy decisions were based upon someone not reading the whole study, but to proceed. And again, so you can't fault them. They did with the best information they had available. But however, though, now we get into the really good information as far as what was brought up as the counter. Are you ready? Here we go. Now, this has to be peer reviewed. This is the information that which they utilized, but somehow they basically uh, gleamed over. I should say gleamed over. They were practically asleep when, if they ever read it. Uh, they said most of the super spreading events occurred in limited ventilation areas. Uh, but that, that as you go down the study, and it looks about outdoor transmission as follows. Do, 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 do. I'm going to go to the highlighted areas. You see exactly they're working as lows, escalations. 
You see, it's not just an immediate exposure. It's basically how long you have to be exposed to the individual that has the virus before you actually get infected. It's not like it's not like the movies where it's like you know, a zombie bites you, you're infected. Well, I don't know if that works with COVID, but still, just the same. Uh, but however, outside of that, it requires a little bit of acclimation and continuous exposure. Minor illness, keep that in mind because you're going to go through that. Uh, they said it's basically a common cold. But we're going to review that more in a second. Here we go. Ready? Let's go to the highlight areas. Do, do, do. Because we're going to lead to this, it's going to be fairly important. Adult respiration rate, 5 to 8 liters meter. Now, ah, let me, forgive me for our mumbling. While resting is about 5 to 8 liters per minute. And light activities, minute volume may be around 12 liters. Remember that because of this. 15 liters a minute, nose deposition, with masks, without mask. Remember we covered this physics of fluid back in October as well. 15 liters a minute with the mask if the virus is below five microns. This is the information which basically begins to correlate, which causes a lot of individuals to question the efficacy of mask use. Yes, uh, if it's saliva and saliva droplets, without a doubt, it's going to block it, which masks work very well for bacteria, especially in 95 masks, if the individual knows how to wear it appropriately. You put a surgical mask on a person with a large beard, and you're basically fooling yourself. But outside of this, if the mask is even fitting perfectly, so if perfectly fitted mask, this is what we have below five microns. Remember, N95 masks work effectively, I believe, up to three microns, 15 liters a minute. We're going to come back to the physics of fluid in a second. I just want you to focus on this five to eight liters a minute while a person's resting. If the breath of an individual is below 15 liters a minute, that's what happens in the mask. If the virus is below five microns. So we'll come back to that in a second. Six air exchanges per minute. You're going to see that quite a bit as far as that, as we review the data down. So I just want you to focus on that. If you see like AC something like with six, here we go. It says no viral load challenge without a COVID that can be found at the time or right in the study. Adjustments have to be based upon influenza A because it's about, I think a single strand uh, RNA or something like that. All right, here we go. Again, for expediency, I'd love to read you the whole thing, but we don't have that much time. And wonderful table. Again, I'll have the links to this particular study as is. So you can see the viral loads, air exchanges. Remember, we just looked at that a second. Uh, six exchanges per hour. For, they're looking for average. That's where you started hearing people say in ventilation is the most important thing. More than anything else, ventilation. The opportunity and timing, minutes and hours. Now, keep in mind this third column here, it's going to throw the people off, is days. So, yeah. So, like, you have to be exposed to that one contaminant or individual for one day, 10 hours, and 43 minutes before you begin to pick up a severe illness. Minor illness, five minutes, for example, exposures, and so on and so forth. Minor, like a cold like thing. But you're going to get some interesting information on how they, uh, how would you say, extrapolated or contemplated ways to basically develop an immunity to, uh, now I'm not going to say that word, but, you know, def solid defenses against SARS-CoV-2 lookalikes. Right, here we go. The term mild illness is a clinical definition for flu-like symptoms. Minor illness can mean common cold. Uh, those numbers are minor, mild. Here we go. It's possible. Now, this is their. This is how they uh, extrapolated, I should say, or contemplated or conjectured in a way that they saw was the ideal way of basically developing an immunity to, um, again, I can use that word, a resistance to COVID-19 um, propagators, like SARS-CoV-2, or other uh, basically elements. Now keep in mind the original strain of COVID-19 is rarer now, or I should say SARS-CoV-2, the original variant that caused COVID-19. So a lot of the studies were initially done on that original variant. So these new variants are always going to uh, put new variables into the game, but to proceed. It is possible that immunity may begin developing at even shorter intervals. It is possible that by rotating medical staff, 
work through COVID-19 patient areas at exposure intervals below the low end of this range several days apart and monitoring antibody test uh, levels could help provide a path to immunity and increase the ability to work with increasing exposure level environments with illness. Goes, let's go back to our 1% of dentists showing positive for COVID-19. It is likely that several short-term exposures separated by several days will increase antibody test heaters and as they reach protective thresholds, longer exposures will likely increase those antibody test heaters to a level of sterilizing immunity. Repeat exposure would likely maintain a sterilizing immunity indefinitely. Kind of like with, uh, remember the, basically they found out that you know, part of the reason if a person was chronically exposed to chicken pox, the likelihood of them having shingles as they got older uh, was less likely. Remember we I think we covered that story about three or four years ago. And so, yeah, chicken box exposure was one of the main ways the immune, uh, the immune system uh, chronic. Again, some individuals, obviously, it's not going to work for everybody. But that was one of the hypothesis in basically, I should say, hypothesis in keeping shingles at bay was the child, the children exposure to chicken pox over and over and over again. But proceed. And it goes out of Dom. People not wearing masks or doing light work in a three mile an hour open area outdoor breeze with a pre-symptomatic individual nearby would likely not account for enough exposure to become ill until after over 20 hours. So you mean you got to hang out with that person for 20 hours. People not wearing masks, doing heavy exercise in a three mile an hour open outdoor wind with a sick individual nearby may encounter enough exposure to develop a minor illness. Remember, minor is cold-like in around three hours. So that means you have to be by that individual for three hours solid in order to develop a cold-like symptom. And if that occurs, we default back to maintaining light exposure, then being re-exposed over and over again. Again, sounds very, very draconian and it's or archaic in its way, but you know what? If that hypothesis worked, I'd love to find out. Uh, May encounter enough exposure to develop minor illness. People not wearing masks in a typical, remember, six air exchange office with a pre symptomatic individual nearby would remain not ill if the encounter was less than six minutes. So, think for example, like grocery stores or individuals working, for example, in a high traffic area, fast food establishment, so on and so forth, provided it's the customer and not the employee. Are employees working together? Yeah, that could create a problem. In a hairstyling appointment scenario, if done with a common six air exchanges in an indoor environment with no one wearing masks and a pre-symptomatic person, minor, again, emphasize the word minor, not mild, minor, might occur in around one hour and nine minutes, whereas that would extend to four hours and 37 minutes in 24 hour exchange environment would, would significantly reduce the chance of illness in a one hour appointment. So basically what they're saying, if you get that ventilation system going and you have six air, 24 air exchanges an hour, as opposed to six air exchanges per hour, you get good ventilation, you're reducing your chance of basically illness quite dramatically. This is the study that a lot of the politicians were referring when they basically grilled the CDC a few days ago. It is noteworthy that once an individual has reached target exposure level, the individual should attempt to eliminate further exposure for several days so that their adaptive immune system may respond to the exposure before encountering additional exposure. Again, what she's basically talking about is self-inoculating in a very, very uh, interesting way. A level of exercise after exposure can improve the probability and speed of immune system response by accelerating viral movement in the secondary lymphoid organs, SLO germinal centers. Again, I'm reading, I'm not using my own conjecture. But however, though, to add publisher bias, that could explain probably the extremely low, I don't know of any, basically, study in reference to people getting uh, COVID exposure in a gym. Study. Not talking about word of mouth. Studies. So that could be possibly why. Because gyms tend to have very good ventilation and they have people exercising. Duh. To proceed. By knowing the type of individual is most likely to be encountered pre-symptomatic or sick, and the likelihood of encountering an ill person, one in 1,000, or confirmed sick, that's where the politicians got the opportunity for one in 1,000 chance of they said less than 1%, but again, 1 in 1,000 chance, 0.01 if you go by the Italian study. 
One may discover a time limit estimate that meets one's personal risk tolerance. It's important to keep in mind that these are estimates and that the actual times can vary widely based upon large number of factors that include the amount of sleep, eating habits, exercise, and other factors too numerous to express like comorbidities and so on and so forth. And also could explain why the incredible high percentage of individuals that get sick in nursing homes, which obviously, ironically, as a tragic uh, vector in individuals, they're basically locked away in long-term care facilities. Henceforth, you had 1% of the population with 30% of the mortality. Uh, keep in mind now with looking at ventilation, exposure, you, you see where I'm going with that, or you see where they're going with that. It was very, very important to have people outdoors more so than locked away indoors. And so on and so forth. Really good article. I will link that to as well. And of course, I love this last part. If primary education included content similar to the study as a health class assignment, a tremendous epidemiologically protective step forward would accompany the next generation. And yeah, I strongly, before anything else, everyone's wanted to teach their own social engineering class in school. If you really, really, really want to make a difference, teach statistics, teach how to read, teach hypothesis testing, teach biostatistics, how to read studies, and so on and so forth. Again, I will read these studies and I'll cherry pick information in between, which, you know, cause I'm doing it because no one else is. But however, though, keep in mind, I openly will say, some of the information I'm cherry picking. And I also have to say I have my own biases. But however though, the reason it comes to life, for example, like in the vaccine VAERS report, is I bring it to the attention not because I am determined to be right or to outreport anybody on my very, very small YouTube channel, is because I can't find anybody else doing it. And I feel like it has to be a service at least to bring to the attention to at least where someone could better explain uh, why that outcome is as follows. But to proceed further into the research, da da da, I think, no, oh, here we go. This is where I want to go. All right, so let's go, let's go back to this real fast. So I basically want to look at the airflow. We already determined that SARS UV 2 is micronized below 5 microns, anyways. So basically, we're looking at this adult respiration, and this is important. So as we go back to basically the physics. Uh, yeah, from the physics of fluids. This is where it is. And this is where I keep on saying those individuals which wear masks and cars and things like that have to be really, really examined heavily. Not just for exactly for the disruption of the microbiome, especially orally, because now you hear people say there's COVID mouth now because the microbiome of the mouth is so incredibly disrupted now from chronic mask wearing that you're actually developing a dysbiosis for the environment. For those not familiar, meaning you're messing yourself up if you're wearing a mask the entire time because a lot of the bacteria in the environment, yeah, some of it's bad, but you know, evolutionary wise, it was an access for a lot of the good parts of the microbiome. But a lot of dentists will show you, tell you now too, if your microbiome in your mouth is messed up, it could lead to other factors uh, as well that are not beneficial, which ironically will increase the vulnerability to diseases such as we are reviewing today. So look at this, 15 liters per minute with mask. All right, you see that, without mask. But again, they bring down this real point right here and just to reiterate and to confirm the information that we're looking at, particularly at 15 liters a minute, again, 15 liters a minute. We're only talking five to eight liters a minute here, so I'd love to see the data on that. So 15 liters a minute, the nasal retention of one micron to three micron ambient aerosols is even higher by wearing a 65% filtration mask, then without a mask at all. This situation is expected to worsen for flow rates lower than 15 liters a minute or wearing a mask with lower filtration efficiency, i.e. double mask, triple mask. My gosh, again, we're just having a conversation here as reading. Uh, I'm not trying to convince anybody one way or the other, but you can see uh, as you begin to look through the data and the research, uh, and again, it's not that the fact is there aren't uh, arguments. This should, I never want to say there's an other side. And I hate the word, you believe this, you believe that. It's what the data represents. And I think the best way to look at something is very Boolean. Boolean being true, false, greater than, less than. Uh, risk greater than the vaccine. Uh, COVID can be more harmful than the vaccine. 
uh, is the risk of the vaccine less harmful than the risk of COVID? Just very Boolean. I'm not interested in uh, politics. I'm just interested in whether it works better, risk to benefit ratio is favorable or not. Uh, but reality, you know, when they threw away the Denmask study, a reference to saying masks per se showed no statistical significance, at least in that element. And then they basically favored it in front of a, a, a study which was done uh, where the data was collected by SurveyMonkey. Um, you know, there, there, there's a problem. And to me personally, I don't want to ever see this happen again because of all the mitigation factors that were researched as well, they didn't pick up one of them. So I don't, I mean, I don't blame, I mean, honestly, they can say they have your best interest in mind, but then if the best, your best, if your best interest is in mind, then why aren't they basically incorporating the multitude of mitigation factors from medications to lighting, to heat, to oxygen, or I should say ozone, and so on and so forth, all the way down the line, I haven't seen them incorporate one, except again, the same factors from the Justinian plague, masks, distance, isolation. So many, many centuries later on, I guess we're repeating history. All right, then let's go into the data as follows. Ready? Here we go. But boom, I'm going to move real fast. Going to try to get it done by in 50 minutes and to just to make things interesting. All right, that's the vaccine reactions. We covered that, and we'll close out with that. So you basically if you want to freeze the screen, you can. You can. Brazilian information, as I promised, I worked with the data frame on that one. The data frame is miffed in reference to the ivermectin, uh, basically uh, distribution, a million doses, and so on and so forth. I can't get the data the way they showed it uh, because they're not reporting the exact date. And keep in mind that ivermectin was only distributed for two weeks. So I need to find out the last day of distribution. If I get that information uh, in reference to the Brazilian cities and states, uh, then I can get you decent information uh, in reference to the validation of the ivermectin distribution. And if I can't get Brazil, then I'll do the data reference in reference to the Paraguay. All right, let's go to the, let's go to basically the Monte Carlo. I right, have Monte Carlo prediction right now. Uh, new cases per million. This is as of May 16th, working out the data. If we continue down this route, you can follow the mean, uh, provided there's no new variants that come out up to uh, September 27th. You're looking at a pretty low cases per million, so a nice slope downward. Uh, deaths per million, following the same data, boom, going down pretty low. All right, let's go to the next one. So you're looking, at, if you're going down to less than 0.2 deaths per million, that's pretty That'd be pretty uh, hopeful. Uh, but it could be as high as, again, for those not familiar with Monte Carlo, these are iterations of potential predictions based upon past data. Uh, looks like it'd be, you know, again, one death, even then at the higher end by September 27th, would actually be quite good. Again, world mass data, don't bust due to the world, the audit data. All right, here we go. Mortality to percentage uh, positive cases. Again, what this is, the number of positive cases that end up in mortality. Not much changed truly since October for the world. Again, I think that's being affected by um, potential uptick in India. So as we go down the line here, new cases smooth, new deaths smooth. We begin to see a drop, a precipitous drop starting right about here. And again, with epidemics, they tend to collapse. Uh, mortality percentage right down here, so below the 2% line. All right, so there we are. New deaths per million, it's going a downtrend. Um, again, our Asian friends were really seriously went untouched. Uh, Sweden's dropping now again. Uh, this is the United States cases per million. Uh, people say, oh, it's the vaccine. All right, let me show you this. There are very few vaccines distributed by January. All right, and in fact, they started coming out more towards this area here. If anything, the vaccine distribution was poor, but if you were like, again, this is publisher bias, you can make an argument where it's for delaying the cases per million. But right about here is when the vaccines started getting distributed heavily. I mean, we're only at 30% right now. Here it was like, like 5% of the population. I knew they were going to try to take credit for it. But if you know your data, this would begin to drop, begin to collapse in January. And again, right about here, you would have about 10% of the population vaccinated. 
So if they're trying to say vaccines are the reason for the drop, uh, the best you could say is a correlation. All right, in case of the positive rate, uh, this was the USA again, January, February. You see what I mean? Look at that. Look at that. That's like that's like new cases moved per million. This is this is where it is, right about here. Uh, was that third week of February? And the vaccines were like just barely rolling out, March, April, then May. So this is all the times of vaccine distribution. Here, I think, again, you had 5%, 10% uh, total population. So no, you, you, no, 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 don't, don't, no, they're not going to take credit for that. All right, here it goes. It's going down. Boom, 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 boom. I'm just going to scroll down real fast. Da, da, da. Yeah, we'll guess, remember that is, that's basically New Test USA versus all of Asia. And all of a sudden in April, began to pass up. But even then, uh, overall, averaging-wise, you're still doing better. Even though I don't know what's going on in India, but the India's death rate now has a billion people, and it's about 2.5 per million, which is about the exact same as the United States. Uh, actually, no. So I take that back. The United States is at 1.8, I think, per million. Here we go. Da, da, da. Here. So here we are so far. The United States experienced one death for every 562 people. And all of Asia, one death for every 7,483. And again, that's the, our data there. Uh, the world, you know, we showed the drop. Totally the mortality percentage, people fully vaccinated per 100. Right there, right now. So that's what gives you an idea. But even then, look at the drop in the curve. Da, 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 da. Let's go that way, that way, that way, that way, that way. That, that, that. Let's see. Yep, and all of a sudden, Asia is beginning to drop. Let's see how fast this drops. Look at the steep incline, but next week will be interesting. All right, so there we go. There, 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 there. there. Again, please forgive me. I'm scrolling through real fast. Again, we're looking at Europe. Let's go straight to Europe. Europe, new cases per million. Look at that. And they had a problem with vaccine distribution. So again, we're going to use this as a correlation because we need a case, an area which has virtually no vaccines being distributed uh, compared to the United States. So you, when you have pers perspective, you know, well, if Europe is there and they have, you know, low percentage of the population is vaccinated and they're experiencing the same drop, then you really can't make a case for the vaccines. Again, especially we looked at that last time about how many you have people you have to vaccinate to prevent one case. Mortality per million, look at that. Now keep on. This is all Europe. But even though right there, you're right, right in line with the United States. Uh, Europe cases mortality, da da da. And let's go to the next one. Uh, world masks, don't pay attention to the mask data. Oxford University, seems like they're trying to update their data, but you know, the United States, no. Uh, it's not a level four. And it changed a little bit, but not a lot. Let's just go straight to India, because that's the, I don't know how we pass over Brazil, but there seems to be a drop. So like Brazil just passed off the radar and everyone started to focus on India. Well, what about Brazil? They have a far higher death rate per million, but then no one started paying attention. It tells you how the media changed the perspective. Now there we are, a little over 2.5 deaths per million. Uh, and again, that's right around where Spain is. Right around where France is. Look at the United Kingdom. Like nothing. Um, but the 2.5 is right around where Italy is. And so you can see, for example, the 2.5 per million in India, of all places, now they have many people, uh, is really about the same ratio of everyone else that's basically having issues with COVID and if you accept the our Asian friends. See Brazil right there? That's messy data. That's because of the way they did the date thing, which I explained earlier. And so if you look at the United States, how does you, uh, India compare to the United States death per million? Right here. A little bit below the 2.5 range. But again, it's all how you basically mold the story. To proceed forward, oh my gosh, I'm running out of time. Let's just go right to hospital occupancy. There's California. We'll just look at that right fast. Look. Ooh. Yep, it's California. It stays in lockdown mode. Uh, what's this one? Up. 
vaccine distribution. All right, this is the Janssen. If you want to look at that, the Moderna, compare it to the Janssen, the Pfizer. Uh, as far as it's out, that's again, that's going to be affecting the VARES. And let's go right to this one right here. I'm not going to go very far because, again, the problem is, guess what? We only have 12 states remaining with uh, mastering mask rules. So now those 12 states become the focus of our controls because now most other states don't have them. So let's look at case hospitalization. Oh, this is New Hampshire working backwards. New Hampshire dropped their mask mandate on April 16th. See? And again, it takes two weeks for a COVID exposure if someone's, uh, if they have it, in order to start showing signs of symptoms. Look at that. Nope. All right. And then case per million. Yep, this, I lifted this map. This is recently, just from last week. These are all the blues uh, lifting the uh, mask mandate. These are reds and not lifting. Uh, the orange basically never had a mask mandate. Us in California, we, we think the whole world has mask mandates. And green already lifted the ma mask mandates. All right, Vermont was one of our border states. Let's go to the more interesting ones. Uh, let's go straight to Michigan. All right, right here, what are we looking at? Michigan, right there. And there is its neighboring states. Nothing's happening. Michigan's beginning to drop as these are cases. Now they dropped their mask mandate. Interesting. Uh, let's go back to do, 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 Minnesota. All right, Minnesota. Now, this was interesting because the neighboring states, none of them had mask mandates. And Wisconsin, which was our focus, was behind two hot spots. Remember last week? And so it's between here and here, which were basically outbreaks of infection. Yet Wisconsin was there. And Wisconsin was untouched, and they had no mask mandate. So again, there's a lot of, when it comes down to questions of transmissibility and growth, doesn't mean things can't change in a heartbeat, but that's called weaponizing uncertainty. But if we had to deal with the data at hand, not the potential for things to occur, it's like trying to say, hey, you know, it's like trying to, per, you know, it's, if you had a person that had a fear of flying, you know what they're going to do. They're going to keep on talking about, you know, um, crashes and things like that, which made the news or basically um, uh, outliers, is what they're going to bring bring it to your attention. And that's what I'm noticing more than anything else is the fact is what we've had is we have people using outliers. I know someone who knows someone, and somehow that became the the the, the basically the mean or the average uh, thought. And unfortunately, the data doesn't support that. And um, I don't know, I just want to end it like that because again, I'm more data oriented than anything else. And honestly, all the mitigation factors and lockdowns and everything else like that, you know, there was a whole lot of hyperbole in reference to them working. And you can make an argument verbally to say they make sense based upon uncertainty or lab settings. But in reality, it wasn't, it wasn't there. New desperate hundred thousand, these were loose states. And now the problem is most there's very few states which are locked down. So this, this what do we hear? Cases per hundred thousand. Uh, now look, all the states are now massive states. Ninety six point eight three uh, versus one hundred and thirty three point three seven eight. Uh, new case again. It looks like the exact opposite. It's a psychological barrage of basically fear and hostility over an entire year uh, that basically may have had uh, it's just not worth it. And the, the collateral damage to recover. Uh, from a lot of the, especially the children affected by COVID-19 lockdowns, which which seemed to be unnecessary because a lot of our Asian friends didn't have to lock down schools or close them, whatever it came down to be, uh, for any long period of time. And um, there were, it, it was not data orientated. And again, I don't care about politics. I just care about data. And if the data supported the other way, that's fine. But when I when this first thing got became announced, I mean, we're like running out of ventilators and opening up tent cities and everything else like that. It was easy. We're exp I was expecting like, you know, something from the Middle Ages, like the bubonic plague to strike and, you know, have like this massive mortality thing. But then when it came down to grocery stores, putting one-way lanes in and and basically, I'm not going to name any names, of big uh, hardware stores actually setting up cages for people to walk through so they could stay separated like uh, animals, it, it lost me. It lost me. But again, I don't only report the data 
That's my personal feelings itself in reference to it. I just don't see the data to support a lot of the pandemic mitigation strategies that were implemented. And I can understand in the beginning, but after three or four months and there was enough data accumulated to make uh, rational judgment calls about the future, it became more of a, a tribal thing. And that that's not good. When I started hearing scientists be referred to as conservative scientists and liberal scientists, that's chilling. But outside of that, again, well, the information we covered as follows. All right, we recovered the data. All right, we looked at outdoor transmission, the original study, uh, basically that the politicians were using. Dental procedures, 1% of dentists uh, basically ended up being positive and they could not find um, any COVID in the um, aerosols f for, for dental patients, uh, which was, so no signs of the coronavirus. We covered hand dermatitis, and again, for healthcare providers and professionals out there, 92.6% uh, have transepidermal water loss and now have dermatitis, and two thirds of the general public do as well. Uh, actually, you know, probably heading up, upwards pretty fast. That's pretty scary considering how important the microbiome and skin is. And then the various data set we covered. Again, the links will be there as follows. Uh, we covered, um, which is, look at the size of the data set, just, just grow like crazy. We covered the uh, aerosolized effect, the original study, which basically came up saying one, uh, less than a 1% chance, or it could be as low as one in 1,000 chance. Uh, and ironically, the recommend, not recommend make a hypothesize and potentially chronic exposure being one way, chronic light exposure, uh, being one way of developing defense against it. You know, like with old, like, you know, type of movies when used to people try to develop a, a resistance to like some sort of adverse substance. All right. And then basically we referred back to basically the, um, uh, the physics aspect in reference to fluid deposition in the nose and how generally if the potential virus is below a certain level. Uh, this is just an example of um, micron deposition. If you want to look at how you get a greater buildup inside the mask when the virus is below a certain area, and that's at 30 liters a minute. And of course, we looked at 15 liters a minute and 15 liters a minute uh, was basically, you know, just um, was, it, was it even twice as much as an average adult at rest and liters per minute of airflow. So who knows what it is for a person sitting down with a mask at 65% filtration. But you get the idea where it's going. Again, good night. It is now 1.45 a.m., May 16th. I'll pull up the rest of the VAERS data. Hopefully I'll have it basically set in a way which is um, uh, a little bit more detailed as far as us learning potentially what is, um, what is affecting the data so dramatically. And um, again, this is really, really hard to read, but regardless of that, it needs to be read by somebody. Gratitude, thank you, and gratitude to all the researchers out there as well on the information that we use every single week. And to all the people that watch this long, I'm, I thank you, thank you, thank you, humbly. And I'll catch you all next time. See you then. Bye.